I'm Ann Ryman, a senior reporter with the Arizona Republic, and I'm here to talk about the Me Too movement. The Me Too movement started in October when a growing number of women came forward to share their stories on social media about sexual harassment and sexual assault. Representative Trent Franks resigned his seat after two female staffers in his office complained that he asked them to be surrogate mother to his child. The Arizona legislature is investigating several instances of alleged bad behavior on the part of members. And in Alabama, Republicans lost a Senate seat after candidate Roy Moore was accused of sexual abuse and child molestation. Okay, so let's go to our first question then as it relates to personal behavior. Um, Dr. Tippernanny, we'll start with you. Um, Trent Franks left under the cloud of sexual harassment and retaliation. Um, there, the Arizona legislature has been investigating similar bad behavior for some time now. Uh, the Alabama Senate race may have turned on the behavior of a flawed candidate uh, just last month. Um, how can you assure the voters in the 8th District that your behavior, past or present, uh, won't be an issue for them. Well, that's an incredibly timely question, and I appreciate it. Um, first, I guess I would say uh, my heart goes out to all those folks, all those women who spoke out, mostly women, some men, on the Me Too movement. Those were voices that needed to be heard, and I'm glad that they've finally been given a voice, uh, been given a, an outlet. Uh, what we've learned is that there should be no repercussions. Those people should be allowed to speak without any fear of backlash. Um, we need to make sure that the workplace, the, the home, um, social gatherings, those are all safe for men and women alike. Uh, as far as my own personal responsibility, uh, I am confident that I have been taught the values of mutual respect, um, empathy. These are the things that have guided me my whole life, and these are the values I teach my husband and I teach to our children, and I'm, I'm comfortable and confident in, in my, um, my moral space, I guess, uh, without sounding preachy. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not concerned about that, but I would encourage um, anybody who's been a victim of any sort of sexual assault or sexual abuse to have the voice and the courage to speak up. Okay. Uh, Ms. Westbrook. This is an incredible movement. Um, it's been needed for a long time. I'm so incredibly proud of all the women who came forward to talk about the allegations that have, they've held inside uh, for so long. Um, we're at a trying time in the United States history, and I believe we're going into a, a better future for all where equal opportunities are available, regardless of your sex, gender, or your sexual orientation. I'm confident in my past. Um, I was very fortunate to live with my great-grandparents for a number of years. They taught me my values and the decency um, to treat other humans um, with the same amount of respect that you'd want for yourself. Um, I'm confident in my past, and I will lead by example for our nation. Okay. Um, next question. Uh, we'll start with you, Ms. Westbrook. Um, Democrats haven't won in the West Valley since 1980. Uh, that was Bob Stump at the time, and he quit the party a few months after that. And um, the party just really uh, has struggled. Republicans have a 17 percentage point advantage among registered voters. Uh, the Democratic Party didn't even field an official candidate last cycle. Um, why should people think your campaign can break through this uh, fairly conservative district and resonate with voters? And how would you represent constituents who are probably a lot more conservative than you are? Well, um, it's unfortunate we haven't had a Democratic candidate in so long. Um, there hasn't been a democracy in the West Valley, you could say. The Democratic Party should be running candidates in every county, every legislative district, and every state um, at, at state level. Um, what we need to be doing um, as Democrats is talking about the values that hit home um, with middle class families and low income families. My candidacy is that. Um, I am a middle class woman. Um, I grew up in poverty. I speak for the people that are not heard, um, the people that feel like their voice doesn't count. Um, I am not a stereotypical politician. I didn't come from wealth. Um, I came from the bottom and came to where I'm at today in front of you. I never felt that my voice was important. I never felt like it mattered. I never felt like it did count. I felt activated to, to, to fight back against this establishment and the GOP and channeled it into this congressional race. My candidacy is a candidacy that grasps home with Republicans, 
Democrats and independents because I am I am I am a populist candidate. I am running for the people. Okay. Um, very similar to, to Donald Trump. Right. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tipper Nanny. I think there's a lot of reasons to be very optimistic about this race. Quite honestly. You know, first of all, there wasn't a serious Democratic challenge to Trent Franks in many cycles, so we don't have a great comparable race. And then you look at this incredible wave of enthusiasm coming across the country, whether it's been Alabama, New Jersey, Virginia. Democrats are engaged. They're mobilized. They're energized. People are paying attention. They're, they're asking about the issues. They're going to the polls and making sure their voices are heard. And frankly, it's brought a lot of people into this conversation that haven't been here in a while. And I'm finding when I'm knocking on doors, they're wanting to talk about the issues. They're not talking partisan ideology. They're asking, what are you going to do to make my life better? And frankly, they're happy that there's somebody coming to their door in CD8 that is actually asking, you know, where can we make a difference for you? Because that hasn't happened in a long time. So I'm incredibly optimistic. We have independents engaging with our campaign. We have Republicans. Women are turning out. And uh, the energy is there. It's on the ground. And I'm incredibly excited to see uh, the results of this election. OK. Um, next question. Uh, we'll start with you, Doctor. Mm -hmm. um, Neither of you brings any significant elective experience uh, to this campaign. Um, so help voters get a sense of who you are uh, politically. Um, can you identify a contemporary political figure um, that you think most closely represents your own views to help us sort of understand how to think of you? Well, that's an interesting question. And I mean, quite honestly, I, I don't come from a po political background. I'm not a politician, as you said. Um, and that's exactly why I entered this race, because to me, this is about problem solving. It's about ideas that actually make a positive impact in people's lives. I think that's what our leaders should be doing. They shouldn't be preaching an ideology. They should be listening to their constituents, hearing their concerns, working on a nonpartisan basis, and really trying to solve those problems. That's what I've been doing all my life. And it's not a political ideology. That is just the idea that we should be working for the people that elect the leaders and actually making a positive impact in their lives. And I think that's lost somewhere because people are too attached to a political ideology or to a particular po political mold, mold. And I think people are eager to have problem solvers and folks who are really looking to make a positive impact in their lives. Okay. Ms. Westbrook? I don't think you answered the question. Um, I, when you, when, when I am a populist candidate, um, as I said, similar to Donald Trump, but only with facts and figures. Um, I grew up in severe poverty. Um, there was at one point in my life where we were living out of my mother's car, and I even ate out of trash cans. And I'm not ashamed to say it, because that's where I've came from. I'm a fighter for the people. I've been through multiple layers of social and economic classes, and I've survived. I'm a fighter. That's what Congressional District 8 needs. Congressional District 8 needs an authentic voice that they can see a representation of themselves. The time has been too long since we've had actual real champions for people in our United States House of Representatives. When our forefathers drafted the Constitution, they said to be a member of the House, you needed to be 25 years of age and live in the state for seven years. With the amount of wealth and equality that has plagued our nation over the last 30 to 40 years, we've drifted away from that. It's time to get the government back to the people. I am. Um, proud to say that I'm a proud progressive. There's people that I admire, Bernie Sanders, Tulsi Gabbard, Keith Ellison, um, the champions in our house right now um, that are standing up for people and the issues and taking on the money in politics. Okay. Um, so let's go to our first wild card question. Uh, in this case, we'll start with you, Dr. Tipper mm -hmm. Um This question comes from one of our readers, Scott Minor. Um, there were originally three Democrats who submitted enough signatures to qualify for this, uh, this ballot. Um, one of them was disqualified, and Ms. Westbrook came within a few signatures of also missing the ballot. Um, their signatures were challenged in court by uh, Linda Vesio, a supporter of yours. Um, did you discuss this matter in advance with Ms. Vesio, and did you hope to win the Democratic nomination by eliminating your competition? So, Ron, um, look, we were incredibly excited. We delivered over 2,000 signatures uh, to get our name on the ballot. And I was thrilled because not only did that reflect the hard work of our incredible volunteer army and the energy and the, the support we have at the grassroots level, um, but it showed the general enthusiasm out there for, for this race. 
But another reason we did that is we wanted to make sure we had a good buffer. We know that signatures are challenged all the time on both sides of the aisle. That happens routinely. I've heard that from many people, even though I'm new to politics, the folks who are not know that. And it's about playing, making sure everybody's playing on an even playing field, making sure people are legitimately on the ballot uh, who have the minimal uh, number of valid signatures. And so that's what it was focused on. It wasn't focused on anything else. And quite honestly, I know that Brianna is familiar with this. I don't think that that was news to her. She actually inquired with me about challenging gene signatures. So it was not news. It was typical. It was routine. And I'm proud that we both made it on the ballot. And I look forward to a strong primary de uh, debate and campaign. And to be clear, did you consult with her before uh, she pursued legal action to challenge? She initiated it. And obviously, being a supporter, she told us that she was initiating it, and there was no reason for us to object. It is something that happens. It's to make sure we're all on an even playing field. And I'm thinking, you know, look, people are going to elect us, one of us, to be lawmakers. I think it's the least they can do to make sure we're following the laws ourselves. Right. Okay. Hmm. Any response? And the least you could do as a candidate is release a statement immediately rather than waiting four days. Um, Yes, we uh, barely made it over the threshold, uh, but it's a reflection of me. I'm working full time while running for office. I'm still working 55 hours a week. Um, I was not, did not have the ability to, to pay for help, um, did not have the ability to take time off from work because I have to pay my bills, to pay my electricity bill, my water bill, and put gas in my car. Um, but what it does show you is how powerful people are. Those people that got me over the threshold, they should feel empowered. Their signature counted. Okay. Dr. Tippernani, any rebuttal? Yeah, no, the only thing I would add is, you know what? Our signatures were pulled, too, by two parties. And when that happened, we weren't alarmed. We didn't panic. We knew we had, you know, definitely more than the minimum number, but we also knew it happened all the time. So, again, it's not anything new, and we want to make sure everybody's playing on that same even playing field. Okay.